Oracle continues to pursue a multi-mode converged database strategy. The premise of this all-in-one approach is to make life easier for practitioners and developers. And the most recent example is the Oracle database API from MongoDB, which was announced today. Now Oracle, they're not the first to come out with a, a MongoDB compatible API, but Oracle hopes to use its autonomous database as a differentiator and further build a moat around OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And with us to talk about Oracle's MongoDB compatible API is Gerald Wenzel, who's distinguished product manager at Oracle. Gerald was a guest along with Maria Colgan on theCUBE a while back, and we talked about Oracle's converged database and the kind of Swiss army knife strategy, I called it, of databases. This is dramatically different. It's an approach that we see at the opposite end of the spectrum, for, in, for instance, from AWS, who, for example, goes after the, the, the world of developers with you know, a, a different database for every use case. So, you know, kind of picking up from there, Gerald, I, I wonder if you could talk about how this new MongoDB API adds to your converged model and the whole strategy there. Where does it fit? Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. And by the way, thanks for having me on the Cube again. Pleasure to be here. So, you know, essentially the MongoDB API that or the compatibility that we've introduced with this API is a continuation of the converged database story, as you said before, right? Which is essentially bringing the many features of the many single purpose databases that people love and like and use together into one technology so that everybody can benefit from it. So as such, this is just a continuation that we have from so many other APIs or standards that we support, right? Since a long time, we're ready, of course, to SQL because we are a relational database from the get-go, but also other standards like GraphQL, Sparkle, et cetera, that we have. And the MongoDB API is now essentially just the next step forward to give the developers this API that they have gotten to love and use. I wonder if you could talk about from the developer angle, what do they get out of it? Um, obviously you're appealing to the Mongo developers out there, uh, but, but you've got this Mongo compatible AT API, you're, you're touting the autonomous database on OCI. Why aren't they just going to use MongoDB Atlas on whatever cloud, Azure or AWS or, or Google cloud platform? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, we believe that the majority of developers want to just worry about their application, writing the application, and not so much about the database backend that they're using. And especially in cloud with cloud services, you know, the reason why developers choose these services is so that they don't have to manage them. Now, autonomous database brings many um, top-notch advanced capabilities to database cloud services. We, we firmly believe that autonomous database is essentially the next generation of cloud services with all the uh, self-driving features built in. And, you know, MongoDB developers, like, or developers writing applications against the MongoDB API should not have to hold out on these capabilities either, right? It's like no developer likes to tune the database, no developer likes to take a downtime when they have to rescale their, their database to accommodate a bigger workload. And this is really where we see the benefit here. So for the developer, ideally, you know, nothing will change. You have a MongoDB compatible API, so they can keep on using their tools, they can build the way how the applications the way they, that they do but the benefit from the best cloud database service out there, not having to worry about any of these backend things anymore. And even MongoDB Atlas has a lot of shortcomings still today as we find. Right, well, of course, this is always a moving target, right? The, the technology business, that's why we love it. So, so everybody's moving fast and investing and shucking and jiving. But, but I, I want to ask you about, well, by the way, that, so you're hiding the underlying complexity. That's really the big, the big takeaway there. So that's right. huge for developers. Uh, but, but take, I was talking before about, you know, the Amazon's approach, right tool for the right job. You got, you got Document DB, you got Microsoft with Cosmos. They compete with Mongo and they've been doing so for some time. How does Oracle's API for Mongo different from those offerings? And, and how are you going to track their users to, for instance, your JSON offering? Yeah, so, you know, for, first of all, we have to kind of separate slightly Document DB on AWS and Cosmos DB on Azure. They have slightly different approaches there. Document DB essentially is, you know, 
Um, a document store owned by and built by AWS, nothing different to MongoDB. It's a head-to-head -head comparison. It's like use my document store versus the other document store. So you don't get any of the benefits of a converged database. If you ever want to do a different data model, run analytics over it, et cetera, you still have to use the many other services that AWS provides you to. You cannot all do it into one database. Now, Cosmos DB is more interesting because they claim to be a multimodal database. And I say claim because what we understand as multimodal database is different to what they understand as multimodal database. And also one of the reasons why we start differentiating with converged database. So what we mean is you should be able to, regardless what data format you want to store in the database, leverage all the functionality of the database over that data format with no trade-offs. Cosmos DB, when you look at it, it essentially gives you a mode of operation. When you connect as the application or the user, you have to decide at connection time how you want, how this database should be treated. Should it be a document store? Should it be a graph store? Should it be a relational store? Once you make that choice, you are locked into that as long as you establish that connection, right? So it's like if you say, I want a document store, all you get is a document store. There's no way for you to cross analyze with the relational data sitting in the same service. There's no way for you to break these boundaries. If you ever want to add some graph data and graph analytics, you essentially have to disconnect and now treat it as a graph store. So you get multiple data models in it. But really, you still get you know, a one-trick pony the moment you connect to it that you have to choose to. And that is where we see a huge differentiation again with our converged database because we essentially say, look, one database cloud service on Oracle Cloud where it allows you to do anything you know, if you wish to do so. You can start as a document store if you wish to do so. If you want to write some SQL queries on top, you can do so. If you want to add some graph data, you can do so, right? But there's no way for you to have to rewrite your application, use different libraries and frameworks now to connect, et cetera, et cetera. Got it, thank you for that. Um, do, you have any, do you have any data when you talk to customers? Like, I'm interested in the diversity of deployments. Like, like for instance, how many customers are, are using more than one data model? Do, for instance, do, do JSON users need support for other data types or, or are they happy to stay kind of in their own little sandbox? Do you have any data on that? Yeah, so what we see from the majority of our customers, there is no such thing as one data model fits everything, right? So, and it's like, we're there again, we have to differentiate the developer that builds a certain microservice that makes happy to stay in the JSON world or relational world, or the company that's trying to derive value from the data, right? So it's like the relational model has not going gone away since 40 years of its existence. It's still kicking strong. It's still really good at what it does. The JSON data model is really good in what it does. The graph model is really good at what it does. But all these models have been built for different purposes, right? Try to do graph analytics on relational or JSON data. It's like, it's really tricky, but you know, that's why you use a graph model to begin with, right? Try to shield yourself from the organization of the data, how it's structured. That's really easy in the relational world, not so much when you get into a document store world. And so what we see for our customers is like, as they accumulate more data, as they have many different applications to run their enterprises, the question always comes back as we have predicted since about six, seven years now, where they say, hey, we have all this different data and different data formats. We want to bring it all together, analyze it together, get value out of the data together. Right, we have seen a whole trend of big data emerge and disappear to answer that question, didn't quite do the trick. And we are basically now back to where we were in the early 2000s when XML databases have faded away because everybody just allowed you to store XML in the database. Got it. All right, so let's, uh, let's make this real for people. So maybe you could give us some examples. You got this new API from Mongo. You have your multi-model database. How Take a paint a picture of how customers are going to benefit in, in real world use cases. How does it kind of change a customer's world, the before and after, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the API essentially we have introduced it to, as I said before, you know, make the, life, the world, the lives of the developers easier, but also of course, to assist our customers with migrations from MongoDB over to Oracle Autonomous Database. One customer that we have, for example, that would have benefited of the API, this happened a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, um, it's one of the largest logistics company on the planet. They track every package that is being sent in JSON documents, right? So every track package essentially is resembled in a JSON document. And they very early on came in with the next question of like, hey, we track all these packages and document and JSON documents. Um, would be really nice to know actually which packages are stuck, right? Or anywhere where we have to intervene, right? It's like 
can we do this, right? Can we analyze just how many packages got stuck, didn't get delivered on you know, the end of a day or whatever? And they found they struggled with this question a lot. They found this was really tricky to do in that back then in that case in MongoDB. So they actually approached Oracle, they came over, they migrated over, and they rewrote their applications to accommodate that. And they're happy chasing users in Oracle database. But if we were having this API already for them, then they wouldn't have had to rewrite their applications. Or what we often see, like worry about the rewriting the application later on, right? Usually migration use cases, you want to get kind of the migration done, get the data over, be running, and then worry about everything else. So this would be one example where they would have greatly benefited to shorten this migration time window uh, if we, we had already the MongoDB API back then with this compatibility layer. Yeah, it's a good use case. I mean, it's you know, one of the most prominent and painful. Uh, so anything you can do to help that is key. You know, I remember like the early days of big data, you know, NoSQL of course was the big thing. There was a lot of confusion. No, people oh, yeah. thought was none or not only SQL, which is kind of the more widely accepted interpretation today. But it, you know, really it's talking about data that's stored in a non-relational format. So, you know, some people, again, they thought that the SQL was going to fade away. I mean, some people probably still believe that. And, you know, we saw the rise of NoSQL and document databases, but if I understand it correctly, a premise for your MongoDB API is you really see SQL as, as a main contributor over MongoDB's document collections for analytics, for example. Can you maybe add some color here? Are you seeing, you know, what are you seeing in terms of resurgence of SQL or the momentum in SQL? Has it ever really waned? What's your take? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good point, right? So I think there as well, we see to some extent history repeating itself uh, from, you know, this all has been tried beforehand with object databases, XML databases, et cetera. But if we stay with the NoSQL databases, I think it speaks at length that every NoSQL database that as you rightfully said, so started with NoSQL and then, well, actually we always meant not only SQL, everybody has introduced the SQL-like engine or interface the last to actually join this family is MongoDB now. They have just recently introduced a SQL compatibility for the aggregation pipelines, something where you can put in a SQL statement and that essentially will then work with aggregation pipelines. So they all acknowledge that SQL is powerful. For us, this was always clear. SQL is a declarative language. Some argue it's the only true 4GL language out there, right? You don't have to code how to get the data, but you just ask the question and the rest is done for you. And, you know, we think that as we, you know, basically, is, has SQL ever diminished, as you said before, if you look out there, SQL has always been in demand, right? Look at the various developer surveys, et cetera, the various job skills that are asked for. SQL has never gone away, right? Everybody loves and likes and you wants to use SQL. And so, yeah, we don't think this has ever been, you know, going away. It has maybe just been, you know, uh, put in the shadow by some hypes. But again, we had the same discussion in the 2000s with XML databases, with the same discussions in the 90s with object databases. And we have just frankly all forgotten about it. You know, I, I love when you guys come on and, and let me do my thing and, uh, and I can pretty much ask any question I want because, you know, I, I got to say, when Oracle starts talking about another company, I know that company's doing well. So I, I, I like, I see Mongo in the marketplace and, and I love that, that you guys are, are calling it out and making some moves there. So here's the thing, you guys have a large install base and that can be an advantage, but it can also be a weight in your shoulder, right? These specialized cloud databases, they don't have that legacy. So they can just kind of move freely about, less friction. Now, all the cloud database services, they're going to have more and more automation. I mean, I think that's pretty clear and inevitable. And most, if not all of the database vendors, they're going to provide support for these kind of converged data models. You know, however, they choose to do that. They might do it through the ecosystem, like what Snowflake's trying to do, or you know, bring it in the house themselves. You know, like a like like a uh, like a watch maker that brings an in-house movement, if you will, right? But it's 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 like death and taxes. You know, you can't avoid it. It's got to happen. That's what customers want. So, with all that being said, how do you see the capabilities that you have today with automation and converged capabilities? How do you see that that playing out? What's, do you think it gives you, you know, a, a, enough of an advantage? You know, obviously it's an advantage, but is it enough of, of an advantage over the specialized cloud database vendors where there's, you know, clearly a lot of momentum today? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, honestly, yes, absolutely, right? I mean, we are with some of these databases 20 years ahead, right? And I'll give you concrete examples, right? It's like Oracle had transaction support, asset transactions since forever, right? NoSQL players all said, oh, we don't need asset transactions, base transactions is fine, yada, yada, yada. MongoDB started introducing some transaction support. It comes with some limits, right? Cannot be longer than 60 seconds, cannot touch more than a thousand documents as one, et cetera. They still will have to you know, do some catching up there. I mean, it took us a while to get there, let's be honest, right? We have been around for a long time. Same thing now that happened with version five, it's like they started some simple version of multi-version concurrency control that comes along with asset transactions. The interesting part here is like, we've introduced this also in Oracle 5, which was somewhere in the 80s uh, before I even started using Oracle database. So there's a lot of catching up to do, right? And then you look at the cloud services as well, there's actually certain, a lot of things that we kind of gotten take, we kind of, uh, we Oracle people have taken for granted and we kind of keep forgetting, right? For example, our elastic scale. You want to add one CPU? You add one CPU. Should you take a town down, downtime for that? Absolutely not, right? It's like, this is ridiculous. Why would you? You cannot take a downtime in a 24 7 backend system that runs the world, right? Take any of our customers. If you look at most of these cloud services, or oh, you want to reshape, you want to scale your cloud service, that's fine, right? It's just a VM under the covers. We just shut everything down, give you a VM with more CPUs, boot it up again, downtime right there, right? So it's like, there's a lot of these things where we go like, well, you know, we solved this, frankly, decades ago, that these cloud vendors will run into. And just to add one more point here, right? So it's like one thing that we see with all these migrations happening is exactly in that field, right? It's like people essentially started building on whether it's MongoDB or the other of these NoSQL databases or cloud databases. And eventually as these systems grow, as they ask more difficult questions, their use cases expand, they find shortcomings, right? Whether it's the scalability, whether it's the security aspects, the functionalities that we have. And this is essentially what drives them back to Oracle. And this is why we see essentially this popularity now the pendulum swimming towards our direction again, where people actually act, act, happily come over and actively come over to us to get their workloads enterprise grade, if you like. Well, it's true. I mean, I just reported on this recently, the momentum that you guys have in cloud and posited it's because you got the best mission critical database, you're all about maps. I got to tell you a quick story. I was at a, a Vertica conference one time. I was on stage with uh, Kurt Monash. I don't know if you know Kurt, but he knows this space really well. He's probably forgotten more about database than, than, I, than I'll ever know. Uh, but I, and I was kind of busting his chops. You were talking about acid transactions. So I'm like, well, with no SQL, who needs acid transactions? Just to poke them. And he was like, are you out of your mind? And, and he said, yeah. look, it's everybody is going to head in this direction. It's, it turned out it's true. So I got, I got to yeah. give him props for that. And uh, so, okay, my last question. If you had a message for, let's say there's a skeptical developer out there uh, uh, that's using you know, MongoDB and Atlas, what would you say to them? I would say, go try it for yourself. If you don't believe us, you know, we have an always free cloud tier out there. You just go to oracle.com slash cloud slash free. You sign up for an always free tier, spin up an autonomous database, go try it for yourself see what's actually possible today, right? Don't just follow your trends on Hacker News, et cetera, rumors that you hear out there. Go try it for yourself and see what it's capable of. All right, Gerald. Hey, thanks for coming into my firing line today. I really appreciate your, your time. Thank you for insights. having me again. Good luck with the announcement. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching this CUBE conversation. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.